The Spanish established the first permanent European settlement on the North American coast at St. Augustine, Florida in 1565. The French followed two decades later, building a fort in 1604 at a place called Port Royal in what's now Nova Scotia, and then establishing Quebec on the St. Lawrence River in 1608. In between, the English had tried settling people on Roanoke Island off the coast of North Carolina in 1588, but the colony had mysteriously disappeared by the time resupply ships returned to the area a couple years later. The settlement may have been overrun by local natives, but it's also possible that the abandoned colonists went to live with the natives when their food supplies ran out and when help failed to arrive from England. Throughout the early history of English settlement in North America, colonial authorities were very nervous about colonists going to live with the Indians and regularly tried to hush up reports that some of the poor in the colonies chose to live with the Indians instead of being poor in the colonies. The English published frightening tales of captivity and redemption, although in reality, poor people, especially women, were often better treated in native society than in the English colonies themselves. After losing both their people and their entire investment at Roanoke, the British waited for nearly two decades before they tried settling the Chesapeake Bay region again in 1607. The Virginia Company, a joint stock company chartered by King James I in 1606, sent expeditions actually to explore the coast of North America between the Spanish in the South and the French settlements in the North. And so there were two, and one of them was established at Jamestown, 40 miles inland on the James River. And the second, which was established on the Kennebec River in what's now Maine and called the Popham Colony, failed. In 1620, a shipload of persecuted Puritans that we know as the Pilgrims fled from England and the Anglican Church and landed on Cape Cod. Ten years later, another group of Puritans received a royal charter to establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony at Boston. British colonists in North America did not find a lot of gold and silver as the Spanish had, although they had hoped to. And so they focused on either establishing family farms and raising crops and pasturing animals like cattle and sheep, or growing cash crops like tobacco in the warmer climate of the South. By contrast, French efforts on the continent centered on trade with the natives for beaver pelts, since the growing season was much shorter between the St. Lawrence River and Hudson Bay. Many French voyageurs married native women, in the long run creating a mixed ethnicity community known as Métis today. However, their alliance with the natives didn't change the outcome of the Seven Years' War, which we call the French and Indian War for France in 1763, as we'll see in a bit. The French still lost all of their North American territory to the British and the Spanish, although Napoleon later got Louisiana back and then almost immediately sold it to Thomas Jefferson. The diseases of the Columbian Exchange spread more slowly in places where Indian population density was comparatively lower, such as along the Atlantic coast of North America. But once again, it worked to the advantage of the Europeans. Native populations in the coastal Northeast, for example, were devastated by an epidemic that raged from 1617 to 1619 and killed 95% of the Abenaki people and over 90% of the Massachusetts tribe. This emptying of the land was seen by English settlers like the Pilgrims and the Puritans as a gift of divine providence. Puritan leader John Winthrop wrote about the favor that God had shown to the colonists by killing the natives. And the minister, Cotton Mather, wrote that, and I'll quote it, the Indians of these parts had newly been visited with such a prodigious pestilence as carried away not a tenth, but nine parts of ten, yea, tis said nineteen of twenty among them, so that the woods were almost cleared of those pernicious creatures to make room for better growth. And that is from a book that he published in 1702 called Magnalia Christi Americana, which is Latin for the great works of Christ in America. 
English colonists, like the Spanish, had not deliberately done this to the natives, but they were quick to take advantage of empty village sites and open farmland and of the social chaos among the Indians that was caused throughout this region by the ongoing Colombian exchange. Although many individual settlers probably did try to deal fairly with their Indian neighbors, the rapid growth of these colonies and some differences between European and native ideas of ownership made conflict virtually inevitable. Natives regularly moved to new locations as the seasons changed. They gardened in shifting fields and they hunted. In contrast, of course, the colonists built houses and permanent villages and they fenced their fields. But although they claimed complete ownership of the parcels that they occupied, the colonists also let their cattle and their pigs run loose over the countryside. Since the natives were not protecting their lands in the ways that the colonists recognized with fences, Anglo-Americans or the Euro-Americans believed, or at least argued, that the Indians had no idea of land ownership. The colonists were unaware that native practices had evolved in a world without domesticated livestock. When Indians treated European livestock like wildlife and shot a wandering cow, or when they killed pigs that were eating their unfenced crops, the colonists demanded compensation for the destruction of their property. And of course, more colonists arrived every year. The Powhatan Wars in Virginia, which raged off and on from 1610 to 1646, the Pequot War in Connecticut in 1637, the Dutch Indian War in the Hudson Valley in 1643, and the Beaver Wars, which were a series of wars fought in the 1650s, all ended badly for the natives. Even King Philip's War in 1675, which is remembered in New England as a disastrous and nearly successful uprising by Massasoit's son, Metacomet, who the English called King Philip, would finally decided that enough was enough. Even King Philip's War resulted in five times as many native deaths as English. By the conclusion of that worldwide Seven Years' War, between the French and British, which we call the French and Indian War, in 1763, Northeastern natives were no longer really considered a threat to the European colonies. So before I go on, some more questions for discussion. First, how did English settlement differ from Spanish or French colonialism? Second, how did the Colombian exchange affect English settlement in North America? Third, why did English settlers believe that God had intervened on their behalf? And finally, how did the differences in land use lead to conflict between natives and colonists?